the white man's burden. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need. Wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden and patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride by open speech and simple and hundred times made plain to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Take up the white man's burden. The savage wars of peace fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. And when your goal is nearest to the end for others sought, watch sloth and heathen folly bring all your hopes to naught. Take up the white man's burden. No tawdry rule of kings, but toil of surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The ports ye shall not enter, the roads ye shall not tread. Go mark them with your living, and mark them with your dead. Take up the white man's burden, and reap his old reward. The blame of those ye better, the hate of those ye guard, the cry of hosts ye humor. Ah, slowly, toward the light, why brought he us from bondage our loved Egyptian night? Take up the white man's burden. He dare not stoop to less, nor call too loud on freedom to cloak your weariness. By all ye cry or whisper, by all ye leave or do, the silent, sullen people shall weigh your gods and you. Take up the white man's burden. Have done with childish days. The lightly proffered laurel, the easy, ungrudged praise, comes now to search your manhood through all the thankless years, cold, edged with dear-bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. Thank you. All right. Let me uh, close myself in darkness. <laughs> How many of you liked reading Edward Said's essay on Orientalism. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I knew you would, Michael. <laughs> All right. I hope you like. I hope you like it. By me, we don't usually care, frankly, whether you like it because we're trying to broaden your horizons in Core One and Core Two. But I hope by the end of today's lecture, you you do like it. You appreciate it. Um, I start off here on this title slide with the image of the fortune cookie. And hopefully we'll get back to that a little later. And I picked this particular image just simply because I thought it was fu a funny, a funny uh, little caption there. Please, please, just for a minute be quiet. We don't find those things in fortune cookies very often. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be going through, you know, Saeed's intent in this text in some detail. But I do want you to keep your eye out for a few key terms that I'm going to cover. Uh, hegemony, text, cultural imperialism, uh, the idea of being marked versus unmarked, and paradigm. I may not stop to define all of them, but uh, do keep an eye out for them. All right. So Edward Said, a very influential thinker and a scholar in the 20th century, influential uh, across many different disciplines. Uh, he, uh, his own personal experience plays a, a huge part in what we actually read in today's reading. He's born in, in uh, Jerusalem, British Jerusalem, to Christian Arab parents. So he is born into uh, sort of the last vestiges of, of British, British imperialism. At age 12, he flees to Israel. Um, eventually, he comes to the U.S. and you know does fairly well academically. Uh, Harvard PhD. He becomes a professor of English and comparative literature, as well as a, a pretty active music critic. Um, other noteworthy things about him: from 1977 to 1991, he's a member of the Palestinian National Council, which is uh, the council that preceded the. The, the current governmental setup in in uh, in, in, in Palestine, and uh, very very active in in pro.
pro-Palestinian politics during that period. Now, I put this uh, card up here. You, you can see the caption at the top, theory.org.uk. And uh, I, I really urge you to take a look at that site. It's, it's a fascinating way to approach these uh, kind of complicated cultural and social theories that we talk about in the class. They have about 25, 25 of these trading cards. And you can actually order them as trading cards, or you can just download them. You get more information because it's on both sides if you order, and I don't get a percentage. All right, so Orientalism, um, the essay you read is, is from, from his book, Orientalism, which comes out in 1973. And initially, um, you know, it's received with a little bit of uh, skepticism. But uh, very quickly, in the 70s, and particularly in the 80s, Orientalism becomes influential in, in shifting paradigms in a, a broad swath of fields. Uh, certainly in anthropology, uh, art history, literature, uh, sociology, uh, all kinds of different, different fields, particularly humanities and social sciences, are, are, are influenced by, by the position he lays out in this book. Now here he is, a man of Middle Eastern descent, and he becomes uh, a dominant voice of this thing that we call the Orient in American universities. And I would say while his influence has maybe uh, waned a bit uh, in terms of you know, being someone who is the main topic of conversation in graduate seminars and so on, uh, his influence is still felt very strongly. So, do you ever feel this way? He's very interested in power, all right? He's very interested in power exercised in a variety of ways. First of all, he's interested in, in this idea of institutional exercise of power. Why, for example, are you sitting out there facing me and I'm standing up talking to you? He's also very interested in how that institutionalized power interacts, coalesces with historical exercises of power. So how is a you know, political and military and economic influence uh, wielded until it becomes actual power? <laughs> Over life and death. Is that what you're talking about with the microphone? <laughs> All right. So before I get into seeing too deeply here, let's go back to the reading you just did for a second to talk about or think about how power is exercised uh, in this uh, world, uh, the world of Sherman Alexie's fiction. What's Lohmann's experience of identity uh, as far as or as a result of the historical relationships of Native Americans to foreign colonizers? All right. So part of the story does actually, you know, some of the dialogue, <coughs> some of the monologue mentions uh, being Native American. So being Native American is itself a topic that one brings up if one is uh, identifying oneself as separate, in other words, from this <coughs> primarily white power structure. But there's also, of course, for low man, his tribe, his family, and his friends. And um, it's for Saeed, a very complex combination. And he really wants us to take a look at the complexity of where those historical relationships kind of meet your personal experience. <coughs> this particular uh, photograph, by the way, um, I, can't, I can't remember which uh, Native American figure this depicts, but this is in front of the courthouse in um, Utah. The state court, uh, the state capitol building, I should say. And uh, the statue would have elicited some controversy uh, because the tribes in Utah were largely decimated, and this particular person is a member of a tribe from the East Coast. Uh, but none of the people who had lived in Utah originally are, are represented through this figure. So.